So I was always educationally ahead of my group. I find out that I'm enough of an entrepreneur to be able to sit across a table, talk to a young engineer, and say, I know how to make a product out of that. I know how to make a profit out of that. Guys. Welcome to our our headquarters, the global headquarters of Swipe Sense Incorporated. <laughs> We're a multinational corporation of four people. I think. <laughs> Call it savvy, call it courage, call it visionary, or call it a calling. Over 50 million people call themselves entrepreneur. There are many heroes and icons from all walks of life. Today, entrepreneurs are everywhere, but it wasn't always this way. From the 18th to the 20th century, we saw the emergence of individual wealth through capital enterprise. The entrepreneur was a rare individual who through invention or process was recognized by history and revered as a captain of industry. There were others who approached it differently. In this case, a man, quiet in humility, generous in spirit, but just as enterprising and visionary, created his impact through a simple idea. Let me tell you about Jim Farley. Born November 8, 1928, in the small town of Hutchinson, Kansas, to Jim and Elizabeth Farley, Jim was a small town boy, painfully shy. His father passed away when he was 13 from ALS. He grew close to his family, his mother, his sister. In 1945, 16-year-old Jim graduated Hutchinson High School. The war was over and GIs went back to school. Jim was offered a partial scholarship to Northwestern outside Chicago, but he also had a full ride at Kansas University. Everybody else in the family went to KU. Kansas is a very flat state and the damn university is built on a mountain. I had seen Northwest and I liked what I saw, so I said, let's try something else. That was probably the most daring thing I ever did, was just getting on a train and going to, going to Chicago. The university wasn't on a hill. It was right off Lake Michigan, 2145 Sheridan Road. Alone, with no family or friends, this young 16-year-old took the road less traveled. At Northwestern, I went into electrical engineering school, not really knowing what I was getting into. I joined a fraternity, which is the smartest thing I ever did. Which fraternity did you Kappa, join? I was a Kappa Sig, a great group of GIs. It did a lot to bring me out of my shell. The average classmate of mine at Northwestern was A, older, B, experienced, C, since I was in the engineering school and doing co-op or work a quarter, study a quarter. The professors were a little bit shook because no, nobody was saying just yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. They were saying, why? I don't believe you. In 1950, Jim graduated from Northwestern, a highly trained electrical engineer in vacuum tube technology. As I went across the stage, they said, congratulations, Mr. Farley. You are now a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. The next man said, P.S. You're obsolete. Everything we taught you is wrong. They've invented the semiconductor while you've been in school. Jim entered a workplace full of large conglomerates and government institutions. He was frustrated with the bureaucracy, the unwillingness of superiors to ask why and challenge the system. The saving grace at the time was meeting the love of his life, Nancy. Their paths crossed in Evanston. Nancy was a busy assistant to seven salesmen at the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company in Chicago. A Kansas girl herself, she was a real live wire and became a lifelong foil for shy Jim. Well, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have worked without Nancy. She's been the support, has raised a wonderful family by herself. I just keep telling her, thank God she caught me. Then one day, while Jim was still working at a company, Alan Bradley. We got a call one day from a guy who wanted a motor control. So they sent their best looking salesman out and I met Steve Betcher. Steve was working on a new machine, a lapping machine, and wanted Jim to help him run the company. Jim resigned and took that different path. At the very young age of 28, Jim went to work for Speedlap. We had two things way ahead of our time. We did not build a complete machine. We bought all of our parts. Nobody else in the world did that. Jim bought a minority stake and the company grew quickly. 
In the decades that followed, the company grew and expanded internationally. In 1971, he hired a great businessman, Mike Kazuma, to help him with the Far East operation. The company changed its name to SpeedFam, and as semiconductors and technology grew, so did the level of Jim's success. This small company, run by a shy boy from Hutchinson, went public in 1996. We, I was fortunate enough to get find a wonderful group of people to work with, and they were the ones that made it work. A great amount of it was luck. I could give you a long list of key points in the, in the operation when pure luck changed something. Say, so, you know, I met Nancy, got married, that was a pretty important time. I found Mike Kozuma in Japan, that was a pretty important point. The memory disc business came along, that was a pretty good point. None of those were planned. The opportunity to come up, we'd see them, and we'd grab onto them. Luck was not the reason Jim decided to go to Northwestern. It was the partial scholarship that gave him the opportunity. Jim's company made tools, but Northwestern gave him the most important tool of all, an education. Without it, you, you have to learn to think on your own. With it, you have a chance for somebody to help you think through to make decisions and improve yourself. It, it's not to teach you a trade, it's to teach you to think. Jim received his degree in electrical engineering, and he gave generously to keep the McCormick School of Engineering on the cutting edge. My opinion of Dad, he's a salesman. He's a salesman. Number one of all. He's Which had some benefits for us. We always got to drive around in Lincoln Continentals because <laughs> Dad always needed the big car to go pick up the Japanese businessmen. And uh, he was a businessman, an entrepreneur. With every visit to his alma mater, he recognized a kindred entrepreneurial spirit when he met with undergraduates. As the world entered the 21st century, Jim decided to help them achieve their dreams. This is our first prototype. <laughs> this, just, this was an idea of um, what if we had something like a deodorant roller here. You know, he, you know, Jim didn't take an entrepreneurship class. There was no such thing as an entrepreneurship class here in the late 40s. He did it on his own. So we had this idea about entrepreneurship, and out of the blue, Jim appeared, and he said, I'm here to make that idea reality. Hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I can spell it. I don't think I can, but... Because it's a French word. Jim was someone who was interested in crossing the boundaries in his own work and in his, the way he thought about it, academic work. In 2008, Jim funded the Farley Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. A truly unique program, it fused an interdisciplinary approach where students from different departments would work together. So Northwestern is um, itself an extremely well-rounded university. We have a theater school, we have a journalism school, we have an engineering school, we have a medical school, we have a law school, so we have everything here. That's uh, key to some of the entrepreneurship that Mr. Farley has helped um, to promote here. Both undergraduates and graduate students team together with people from different disciplines. In many universities, this is not easy to do because everyone lives in a silo. The Farley Center then allowed us to take the courses and translate them into practicality. This is the first time I've ever been here. It's really exciting to be here. This is exactly what my father had envisioned with the Farley Center. He'd be really excited to, to be here and see what they're doing. Well, the Farley Center is one of the best things we have going here. It breaks down all those barriers of age and of discipline and brings them together in a truly unique way. Not just unique for Northwestern, but for American higher education. If you go out into even a large firm, you don't develop it just as an engineer or just as a business student. It takes the interdisciplinary to get a product from idea to the market. If you instill in students the ability to recognize what an opportunity is, actually doing something about it, that's what entrepreneurship is all about. That's what Jim did in his career. The Farley Center is a place of openness and inclusion, where teams of bright people can come together, like Yuri and Mert. The problem we're trying to solve as Swipe Sense Incorporated is this nasty problem of hospital acquired infection. About 2 million of these infections happen, and as a result, 100,000 people die. We set out to make hand hygiene as easy as possible for healthcare workers. This is what we came up with Swipe Sense is a portable hand sanitizer. It's really important that people who have an entrepreneurial bent, and they can have that bent in high school, they can have that bent as they get to college. And you get a lot of smart students at a place like Northwestern, but they do need some structure and some guidance. 
Jim did it, you know, he didn't waste many words. The things that he talked about, you know, changed some of our thinking here. Having that practical experience together with the theory was one of the things that Jim and I always talked about, and that is to have a whole brain engineer. What the Farley Center did for us was not just kind of bring us together, but it also provided us with the expertise and a process of taking this big, messy challenge of infections. Um, and it gave us a process to take that on. You know, while this product very well might end up making a huge amount of money, we're in this to prevent those infections and to prevent those over 100,000 people from losing their lives needlessly in our hospitals. The, the key thing in this business is you start with a little lit match and sometimes this lit match becomes like a forest fire. You know, a lot of people say, you know, we would have been successful whether or not the Farley Entrepreneurship Center was here. Uh, it was just fate. But what I think is, is that the, the Farley Center increases the chance of that kind of fate taking place. It increases the chances of these entrepreneurial connections happening. Entrepreneurial aspirations are indeed grand, but to achieve them isn't easy. I think our curriculum here is extremely challenging. It can be easier to stay narrow and learn just one thing very deeply and not come outside that box. The students find that when they do, they do come outside this box, it opens many doors for them. <laughs> Look at all this junk, all this graveyard that we have to go through to get to this. I can just guarantee you right now, before this guy actually There's makes it to the market, box. put two more boxes <laughs> next to each other like this. It's not the romantic image that you read about in all the articles. There's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of ups and downs. It could be very frustrating at times, but it also could be phenomenally rewarding. Nobody is gonna, uh, you know, have an unblemished record because if you have an unblemished record, it means you never took any risks. It means you never really try to do things which were unusual and difficult to do. There is no overnight success. It is a hard journey. But Jim recognized, almost immediately, how to make it more enjoyable. Jim saw the value of not just building a company, but building lifelong friendships. I don't think you can run a company without having good friends that you can trust. I can't do it all, good Lord. Jim really treasured relationships. I thought I wanted to, to be a scientist. And while that is what I actually studied in school, all my activities outside of my classes were in one way or another related to the Farley Center. I don't think I was initially an entrepreneur at heart. It wasn't I was five years old and I always wanted to grow up to become an entrepreneur. You know, Mert might have a very different answer. I think that's a perfect example about the Farley Center, it really brought that out in me. If it wasn't for that center, I would not have been exposed to people like Mert. This whole entrepreneurial path might never have seemed like an option to me. I was gonna take a risk. We were gonna jump off the cliff and, and hope a bridge would kind of build itself under, under our feet as we went forwards. With the Farley Center firmly grounded in innovation, what can we expect from tomorrow's movers and shakers? The concept of working for one company your entire life doesn't really exist for most folks anymore. Our students were looking for opportunities to have greater impact. Some come here wanting to change the world. Entrepreneurship is a way to potentially facilitate that. There were two things that not even my biggest dreams I anticipated that they will come together. A way to kind of bring more creativity into the picture here in engineering. Engineering is very grounded on math and analysis and rigor. If you go too deeply on this, at some point there is no retreat, you, you become trapped. Some kids come and are very savvy when they're 18 years old, but most of them are awkward and gawky and they have misperceptions about what engineering is, what the world is. The vision that Mr. Farley helped us implement here helps us help these kids become more well-rounded citizens. You really see them grow. I think entrepreneurialism is really a, a stance on life. It's, what is your gut reaction when something's presented to you? It reflects itself in every single one of your actions. Uh, that kind of determination and that drive, um, those are purely entrepreneurial traits. When Jim knew something that was important to him, you know, he translated that to you very quickly. You know, it was very clear that, you know, he had all the, the best interests of the student at heart. Jim was a rare person, there's no question about that. Most people I've known consider me a smart person. Now, not every smart person is successful. I think the Kansas upgrowing, the work ethic by my folks, the love of the family just gave me every opportunity to be a success. You know, I teach because I hope I can influence other people. Jim didn't want to teach, but he's influenced many more people than probably I'll ever be able to influence by what he's been able to do with his work here at Northwestern. He was successful for the love of his family, his SpeedFam family, and his Northwestern family. That was his trade secret. 
That was Jim. That was my father. So before I head out to go to my date, guys, I'll leave you with one gem, that one code that we'll live by at Swipe Sense. First of all, always wear protection. Secondly, <laughs> so here's the code that we live by. <coughs> it's a beautiful graphic done by our lovely designer friend, Joey Roth, and he has a scale from work to talk. And if you do all talk but no work, you're a charlatan. If you do no talk but all work, you're a martyr. We strive to be people who talk a lot but also work a lot. And we like to call those folks hustlers. All of us at Swipe Sense one day inspire to be a hustler. So we live by the code and we die by the code. <laughs> Every day I'm hustling. <laughs>